the, the composition of the panel has changed a bit in the last 48 hours due to some illness and cancellations. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with George Werther, and he's going to give a longer presentation that includes not only the content he was going to originally provide in terms of introducing the fire issue um, and its implications for how we think about forests and forest policy, but he's also going to be taking on the aquatics piece of it and talking about how some of the potential impacts on aquatics ecosystems from projects, thinning and restoration projects that are done ostensibly to address fire as a problem and, and the, the actual harmful consequences of those types of projects on aquatic ecosystems. So that's going to be, George is going to combine those two elements. And then I'm Doug Bevington, I'm sorry, George Wardner of the Foundation of Ecology. And then I'm Doug Bevington, I'm the Forest Program Director with the Environment Now Foundation. And I'm going to be trying to cover um, material similar to what Dominic De La Salle of Geos Institute was originally signed up to do. And that is basically it's been a very exciting year in terms of new scientific articles coming out that really um, challenge a lot of the premises that the Forest Service has been using to promote new large logging projects under the guise of reducing fire or based on the premise of fire as a problem or something to be prevented or reduced, that sort of thing. And there have been some really helpful um, studies that have just come out in the past year or so. And what I'd like to do is just go over a few of those studies, make sure that, that people know where to find them, have a, have a sense of, of some of the key points from them, and see those as resources um, for, the, for the forest activist community to draw on. And then finally, um, Justin Augustine has, um, of the Center for Biological Diversity is also going to be joining us. Justin works on forest protection issues in California, and he's been involved in translating some of the science work into on-the-ground policy in the Sierra Nevada as the Sierra Nevada National Forests are beginning their forest plan revision process. So I think his experiences can offer some insights into how to plug this science in and, and the role it's playing in challenging um, some of the Forest Service efforts to use the, the plan revisions to ramp up logging. So that's a general roadmap of, of what we're going to be doing in the next hour and 15 minutes, and, and we'll try and leave a good deal of time for, for questions and, and, and dialogue as well. Okay. So. Before I get started, I'm wondering, can we open that other back door so that you know people could at least stand out in the hallway a little bit and, uh, and well, and also see in. You know, if we got both doors open, it might be possible. Yeah, there's some room up here too. There, that way folks can kind of look through. Me. <coughs> there. It's not going to stay open. There's, there is room up here in the front for some people to sit up here if anybody wants to. I can kind of move up here. Yeah, yeah, why don't you do that? So, um, I, I, my, as a preference to my talk, I put this uh, talk together just about a month ago for the Central Oregon Fly Fishermen's Association. Then at the last minute I had to cancel because I had to go to South America. And, uh, and so, uh, the emphasis, though, has this emphasis on fish, but I have a whole <coughs> preliminary thing about wildfire and stuff. So, George, should we say about 35 minutes for yours? Well, we'll see how. Yeah, yeah just pop me off. So. Okay, I'll let you know when we have about <laughs> two minutes left. I, I've never done it before, so that's part of why he's saying that. <laughs> Not enough. Yeah, yeah, so this is, uh, anyway, uh, this is a book I did a number of years ago on wildfires, and um, even since I did this book, which came out, came out about five years ago, maybe six years ago, um, there's been quite a bit of new science and even changing the thinking that, that if I were to do this book today, there would be some major revisions in some of the emphasis, although, you know, probably 85% of it is still, you know, basically okay. So, but that's the nature of all this science. Uh, go to the next slide. Um, that things are always changing, and even what I say today, if, I'm, if you see me five years from now, I'll probably tell you some other different things. So, uh, anyway, so I'm going to go over the ecological value of dead trees and ecological processes that create abundance of trees and down woody debris or biomass. And then I'll look at how that wood is important to aquatic ecosystems. And of course, one of the major next things that causes uh, uh, dead wood is wildfire. It's an ecological process. I might keep, you know, if you want to stay right there. Okay. Um, and climate, this is a real important thing. 
not fuels is the primary driver of large wildfires. In other words, you know, you can have a fire of, you know, burn a couple of acres and stuff like that, and the fuels are important there. But when you get to the big fires, and we're talking, you know, something like the Biscuit Fire, you know, 100,000 acre, 10,000 acre fires, those are often driven by uh, uh, certain climatic and uh, weather conditions. Building projects are often predicated on the assumption that high severity fires or beetle outbreaks are bad or abnormal, which is not true in most cases, and I'll explain why that is. Dead trees are a sign of a healthy ecosystem, and this should be true, not false, sorry. Uh, <laughs> stay there. So, in other words, a healthy ecosystem has a lot of dead trees. It's not something to be avoided. That's an economic thing that foresters have come up with because they look at, you know, dead trees are not good from, the, from a timber production perspective. But if you're looking at a forest ecosystem, dead trees are a very natural part. And they're a key element in aquatic e ecosystems as well as terrestrial. And dead tree recruitment is episodic. And that's an important thing because things like wildfire, large wildfires and beetle outbreaks, they don't happen every year. You have sort of background mortality that's going on. And then you have, you know, every 100 years or 200 years, depending upon the place we're talking about, you might have a big fire. And that's the bulk of the dead trees that are going to be in that ecosystem for the next 100 to 200 years is coming from that one big fire or that one beetle outbreak or whatever. And so that becomes important. And ecology is not static. That's what I just said before. We're going to learn more. OK, thanks, Vicki. <laughs> so much about fires and the ecological role of dead trees is counterintuitive. And the reason I put this thing about the sun is, you know, we'll all go out and we'll see that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. So it's obvious, it's intuitive that the, the sun must circle the earth. Well, that's how a lot, we know that's not true, but that's how a lot of things in fire ecology is, is that what we think is intuitively true is actually often the opposite. So next picture. First of all, I want to get, one of the things is we have all this pejorative language. I always want to hit this up because you'll read it in media all the time. If any of you get a chance to talk about stuff, <coughs> try to change the whole dialogue because the way we think about things is the words we use. So we have, you know, the fire destroyed so many acres and the fire devastated, you know, uh, the forest, the fire was catastrophic. Even This is a common term to call it catastrophic fire. Well, that's a negative. I call them big fires or large fires. Uh, we fight fires, right? You know, it's something that's bad. You, know, you fight cancer, right? So, uh, and recovering from fire, salvage, log burn, salvage. What a word that is. That's like, that implies that there's no value in that thing unless you log it. Um, so fire was an inferno. So just keep that in mind that we have biased language to talk about things. It's really hard to talk about things like fire without using that biased language. And I mean, when I did that book, I mean, I had these fire ecologists writing uh, chapters in, all of whom were very much in favor of having more fires. And they'd still say the fire destroyed so many acres because it's so ingrained in our way of thinking. Next picture. So now, structure protection is the largest cost of firefighting. Go to the next picture. And that's partly because we have all these people sprawling out into a uh, disaster, so to speak. They're building homes close in in uh, rural areas, out in the trees and stuff. And there's several reasons why this is, you know, it becomes harder to fight fires when you have individual homes like this. It puts firefighters more at risk, like the Arnell guys that died in the front trying to protect houses. And these things also create more fires as well, because things like power lines, for example, a lot of, you know, just to use an example, a lot of fires start because a tree blows over, knocks some power lines to the ground, which starts a fire. So uh, these kinds of things can uh, create more fires and, and also more cost than fighting fires. Next picture. There are a couple of basic ecology things. In the east, things rot, and the west, things burn. In other words, we have a lot, no matter where it is, even here in Eugene, Oregon, in the summertime, I've been living, I used to live in Eugene, I sometimes would go four months without any rainfall. Okay, you get that kind of drought, and, and that's at the summertime when things would be rotting, but they don't rot because it's too dry. So in the west, our main recycler tends to be wildfire rather than rotting things. Next picture. And the east has year-round precipitation. So in the summertime, you know, and all through the year, it's raining there. If you ever lived in the East, God, it's humid. And things, things rot really well. Next picture. But at West, we got cold up high, in next picture, and drought, aridity, and both of these things limit decomposition. Next picture. So um, <coughs> what happens here is the fuels will build up over time, uh, and when conditions are right for a big fire, they, you can't stop them, and firefighters know this. You know, you got to get out of the way when there's certain conditions. And almost all our large fires burn under next picture. Uh, these conditions, which um, next picture, uh, have to do with 
uh, weather and climate. So just to make clear, there are a few uh, low severity, what's called low severity frequent fire models, which happens to do was developed in the Ponderosa Pine Forest in the southwest that has this nice grassy understory. And the story there is that fires would happen uh, on a relatively frequent basis. We're talking, you know, five to ten year frequency. And it would burn through and kill the little trees and the big trees would survive, okay? That model has been applied to, you know, by a lot of people, misapplied to a lot of other ecosystems around the West, which that model doesn't fit. And there's even some new stuff that suggests this model doesn't even fit for ponderous pine all the time. So keep that in mind. But we'll put that aside for a second. But when you go to something like lodgepole pine, which is real common and high in the elevation in the Cascades or in the Rocky Mountains, uh, if you go to fir forests, if you go to Mount Hemlock forests, which are common in the Cascades here, if you go to uh, sagebrush, uh, even in the real dry area, uh, aspen forests in Colorado, all these different, next picture, all these different ecosystems don't burn very frequently. They have longer fire rotations. And, um, and so fuel, you know, think about here's the uh, Pacific Northwest here. This is um, uh, salmon uh, huckleberry wilderness. but. You know, if it were fuels that drove fires, we ought to be having huge fires every year in these places because there's tons of fuel per acre here. But the coast range or the wet side here doesn't burn very often because you have to have the right conditions for a fire. Next picture. So that uh, uh, most uh, uh, forests around here are characterized by what are called mixed to severe blaze. And a mixed severity fire is one where some trees get killed, and not other trees don't burn very much. Uh, or severe fires where you have a large percentage of the trees killed in that particular area of the fire. But most forest types, next picture, are that. So here's an example from the Northern Rockies where I used to live in Montana. Uh, only 4% of the forests were ponderous of pine and dug fir, the low severity fire regime that, and even, like I said, people question it even for here, whether it's always that case. But most of the forests are these kinds, moist montane forests, lower south alpine, upper south alpine, all of these forest types burn at less frequent uh, intervals. And the same thing is true out here in, in Oregon and Washington and so forth. Next picture. So here, here are the plant community types or forest community types that are a mix of high severity stand, to stand replacement. So you've got spruce forest, uh, some Douglas fir, uh, like on the west side here, chaparral in Southern California, uh, fir forest, uh, closed cone, like knob cone pine, bishop pine, monterey pine, lodgepole pine, western large, hemlock cedar, even sagebrush, and even juniper now is thought to be much longer intervals than they thought in the past. So basically, everything but ponderosa pine around here is mixed to high severity fires. Okay, well that has a whole lot of policy implications. Because, um, let's go on past this. When you have these uh, stand replacement fires, they don't happen very often. And fuels are not the driving thing. Again, it is the climate conditions that allow those fires to burn. And, uh, and I see constantly, like I'm, I'm living in Bend now, the Deschutes National Forest is talking about how they have to go and thin Lodgepole Pine Forest because of fuel buildup. Well, there's no na unnatural fuel buildup in Lodgepole Pine Forest. That's the, that's the intervals. It takes a long time for, uh, between fires, so it naturally has. This is in Yellowstone Park, for example. Here they estimate that fires burned everywhere from 100 to three or 400 years between fires. So the Yellowstone fires in 1988 were the biggest fires in history in 100 years. But if you looked over a thousand year time period, you, you'd actually find that the 1988 fires weren't particularly large compared to the historical records and intervals if you looked at the appropriate time scale for that forest. Next picture. Uh, and then, even there's, like I said, some uh, suggestion that even ponderosa pine um, may not follow that uh, uh, model. And there's two things I want to point out in this. This was a, a, a big fire in Montana. This was all ponderosa pine. You can see it's pretty scattered ponderosa pine. And the reason I want to bring this up, well, this was a wind-driven fire, number one, and that's why it burned through the ponderosa pine. Stand replacement burn. But the other thing is, when you go out and look at thin forest stands around here, you won't ever see density this thin hardly. So even this dent, this lightly dense stand, almost savanna-like stand, burns stand replacement fire under the right climatic conditions. And that's an important qualifier. Next picture. And I, and I got this picture from Lick Creek in Bitterroot National Forest in 1913. One of the assumptions is that fire suppression has led to uh, naturally high fuel buildups that are leading to large fires, okay? 
Well, this one, uh, if you look at this here, this is all ponderosa pine, you can see they're all, except for these few big ones, uh, and here, this is almost all the same size, which indicates it was probably started after a stand replacement fire. Uh, and some big pine survived that stand replacement fire, which is not unusual because fires burn in a mosaic. So you will have <coughs> patches here and there that survive, and then that's you know the big old growth, and then you have others. And they're finding out in other places in Colorado, in next picture, uh, in, in Montana, uh, in other places that they've looked at it, they're finding that that model, the Southwest model, doesn't necessarily apply. But even in Ponderosa Pine, at least at the higher elevation levels, uh, would, you might have, um, have some sand replacement fires. All right. So fire is the primary evolution agent of the ecosystem rejuvenation. See, I'm, I'm trying to change the way you think about this stuff. I'm using, I'm, I'm doing the opposite of the Forest Service and the Chimney Institute. Instead of saying the fire destroyed things, I'm saying it rejuvenated things. So that's the way you want to think about it. Fire is a rejuvenation agent. Next picture. And fire seldom burn everything in, in a large fire. There's this mosaic pattern. So this is, this is the kind of situation this, this part would be severe fire, but this is a mixed severity in here, and, uh, and then unburned. And if you look at all these big fires, I've been starting to look at the, the percentages, and next picture, and you're finding that actually, uh, here's the rim fire down in uh, Yosemite. You'll find here, see, <coughs> severe fire was only 33%. In other words, the whole, you got this impression from the media that it was like the whole place was burnt over to toast or something like that, when in fact, most big fires are this mixture of Low, 44% of the rim fire didn't burn at all. Uh, moderate burn, which would we call mixed severity, and then the high severity uh, mixed in here. Next picture. And this is fire severity for large fires. Uh, some data, and you can see again, low severity in all these famous fires. The Biscuit Fire, you might have heard of the Hayman Fire in Colorado, etc. That's dominating, even in these quote big fires. Uh, and my theory, which is yet to be proved, is that uh, a lot of, I, I've, I've often pondered how we could have so much land burn um, un, under low severity fire conditions to be millions and millions of acres because most fires go out. And what I'm thinking now is we have these large fires that actually burn lightly through or hardly burn some of the understory as part of the mix of the bigger fire, if you get what I'm saying. Because these fires might be 200,000, 300,000 acres, but they might have 50,000 acres that's just lightly burned, your low severity fire it, in the mix of the larger ones. Next, next picture. So here's some statistics from my home in 2012. There was 1.75 million acres were burned, but only 13% was high severity. So, you know, it was quote in the media, disaster for fires and and, I, and by the way, I would never say that high severity fires are bad, but we're just trying to just make the point that it, it doesn't dominate. Uh, 63 percent the majority of acreage involved with low severity on burn. Next picture. So here's the cover of my book. And just, just you know, if you'd seen the cover, you would say, oh, this is a disaster. Look at that fire. It's just, you know, burning everything up. So I, I got back a year later. I didn't have my book cover with me, so I couldn't find the exact photo spot. And I wasn't quite in the same spot. But here's the gravel bar that's in that picture. Here's the same gravel bar. I think the photographer was standing here shooting this way. But you can see, you know, a lot of this didn't even burn in that fire. Next picture. So wildfires episodic, and and this is an important point. We are seeing large fires now, and there may be two factors going on, which I'll get to. Global warming might be part of it, but you also find that climate affects fires, and they come in decade-like waves. So you will have long periods of time when there's hardly any fires, and then big fires, and then you'll have a period of time when you have a lot of large fires. So uh, in the Northern Rockies, they found between 1900 and 2003. Majority acreage burn occurred in 11 years. Six of those years occurred prior to 1935, including the 1910 burn, which, by the way, burned 3.5 million acres long before there was ever any fire suppression, bigger than any fires we've had so far in the lower 40 states. And five occurred since 1988 up to this. This would be higher now since that was. But it demonstrates that there are fire decades. And these are determined by climate and weather. Next picture. So, in the years between 1935 and 1988, there was no significant fire years. And that is the time when people say, oh, fire suppression started to really kick into gear. We got air uh, support, we got smoke jumpers, you know, we got more roads so we can access it. But it also was higher than average precipitation and lower temperatures, which favor seedling survival and coincides with the successful fire suppression. So it was a lack of big fires due to suppression 
or climatic condition. Next picture. So we look at this climatic stuff, and here's the first half of the century, last century. Uh, you can see it was warmer. This is because of offshore currents uh, that changed the climate in the Pacific Northwest and the Rockies and so forth. So uh, the, the this area was warmer. We had bigger fires here, and then it got cooler in that same time period where they couldn't find any significant fire years. And then it got warmer again in the 80s, and we started having big fires again. And it's the same time the, the climate changed due to currents. Next picture. Now, as coincidence, coincidence may not be what's going on, but it's pretty strong evidence. Here's some more. This is fire history of uh, Flat National Forest Glacier Park. The blue is prior, 1930s, same period when it was warmer. You can see there's a lot of big fires that happened. Then, from the 1940s to the 1980s, the yellow, that's the same time when it was wet and cool. Hardly any fires burned there. And then 1980 to present, we got a lot more uh, um, uh, red, uh, red and big fires again. Again, correlation, but you know, seems to fit the pattern. Next picture. And by the way, I will mention that all those big fires in the 19, from the 1940s, I mean, from the um, 1980s on, we got the best, most sophisticated fire firing equipment and gear and everything, and we still can't do any better than they used to do back in 1910 when they were out there with mules and you know running around with shovels or something. So uh, here's some here's some other statistic that you got to keep in mind. Most fires go out whether we burn <coughs> anything or not, but we take credit for it. So uh, you know, there's a fire burn that's going to burn an acre or two. We get smoke jumpers in there, they throw some dirt on it, and they say, oh, we put out that fire, you know. And and it's true, some of those fires would just smolder for a month or more and might flare up and become a big fire a month later. But most of those fires are going out no matter what. So this is in Yellowstone where they had a policy until 1988 when they had to change their policy because of politics. But they had a policy where they didn't put any fires out. And they had 237 fires. Only 15 got larger than 100 acres. And all of them went out with any suppression. Every single one of them. So, if that had been on national forest lands, they would have said, we put out 237 fires that would have burned, you know, millions of acres if we hadn't put them out. Well, maybe, maybe not. So, go ahead, next picture. And then this is a thing for the Colorado Front Range, sort of showing the same concept. This is, uh, the blue dots here are all small fires, less than 100 acres. And you can see, most of the fires are going to be small. And then they have a... Um, uh, yellow, there's a few yellow here, there are 1,000 to 5,000, and only red, which is greater than 5,000 acres, and you can just see there's just a few of them out here. So those big fires though, burn a lot more acreage than all these little ones. The, the, this is, the dots are almost deceptive because the dots take up more acreage on the ground than probably, you know, way more than actually burned. If, if you wouldn't be able to see the dots if they put them to scale. Next picture. So, uh, and here's a real interesting statistic. This is a data set from 1980 to 2003. There were 56,350 fires in federal lands in the Rockies. That burned 9 million plus acres. 55,228 blazes out of that total burned only 4% of the entire area. In other words, all these small fires that a lot of times you'll hear agencies say, you know, well, we don't, we don't want, we want to prevent the big fires, but we think fire is really important ecologically. We like those small fires. Well, if you like, if you only, if you could put out the big fires, which I would posit you can't, but if you could, you wouldn't have any ecological work done because those small fires don't amount to a hill of beans. And 0.1%, 50 of the fires were responsible for half the acreage burn. In other words, it's those few big fires that are doing all the ecological work, like the Rim Fire, like the Biscuit Fire. Those are the ones that are uh, the major ecological force out there. Next picture. So we need big fires because the vast majority of fires go out without burning only a few acres. Nearly all acreage is burned as a result of very few large fires. So if you say, like a lot of people are willing to say now, that fires are important ecologically to ecosystems, we have to be tolerant of the big fires. In fact, big fires are, and this is, I'm, I'm stealing somebody else's thunder because this was in a video I just watched, but I thought it was a great phrase. But big fires are like earthquakes. We can't stop earthquakes, we can't stop big fires. You can only learn to live with earthquakes by you know, making your buildings more secure and structurally, by having plans for emergencies and so forth. And that's how big fires are. We have to learn to live with the big fires. Next picture. So, and I hear this all the time. If we only managed the forest, we would stop or preclude fires. Well, actually, 
Uh, the vast majority of large fires burn not in wilderness and so forth, they're burning on lands that are managed for timber production already. And, uh, and here's a bunch of clear cuts, this has been thinned and so forth, and you can see, this is a Jocko Creek fire, but it's Plum Creek private lands in Montana, and the fire just burned right all through that. Why did it burn all through that? Because the wind was blowing about 40 or 50 miles an hour. Here's some clear cuts, all burned around. So there's no fuel here, but the fire just jumps around. See, the reason is, the next picture, is that with, and this is an area that was thinned and burned outside of Helena, Montana, you can see that the trunks are black. That means that they were cut pre-fire because when, if you cut them after the fire, you'll have gray where the fire didn't burn. So you can tell that this was thin. This is the, this is the density of trees, which again, is much thinner than most thinning projects and it's still burned and killed all the trees. But the next picture, the point is, is that the wind blows embers Sometimes the record is about 10 miles from the fire front, but even a mile or two. So you've got a clear cut here, or you've got your fire line, or you've got your thin forest. You know, the wind's just going to blow it right over all that and often right through it, too. Next picture. So I took this picture in Yellowstone in 88 from a helicopter. I didn't realize what I was doing. But again, to make the point that um, here's a road. That's a fuel break. This is really lightly stocked stand much thinner than any thin forest stands, and it's still, in 1988, because of the conditions, burned right through all that. Next picture. So, big fires are like driving a stick shift car. In other words, you gotta have all these ingredients come together at the same place in the same time. If you do, you get a big fire. If you don't, you don't get a big fire. So you gotta have, um, uh, you have to have fuel, which is anything just like driving a car. I can put gas in my car, but it'll sit there all day just because I have gas and it doesn't go anywhere, right? So I have to, uh, I have to uh, put in the clutch, which could be drought. You have to have push on the accelerator, which could be wind, and you have to have an ignition source to start. If you have all those things in the same place, you get a big fire. Otherwise, if you only have one or two of these things, you can have drought and you can have lots of fuel, but you won't necessarily get a big fire if there's no ignition. You can have ignition and have lots of fuel, but if there's no <coughs> wind and drought, you don't have a fire either. So that's important. You no, know, all this come together. Next picture. So why didn't Yellowstone burn in 1986 or 87? I mean, seriously, there's just as much fuel there in those years as there was in 1988. But what happened was, uh, next picture, in 88 we had extreme drought, the driest year on history for Yellowstone, and this is true of most big fires, next picture. Um, you had low nighttime humidity. Often the humidity goes up at night, but in Yellowstone, during the, particularly when it was burning really well, uh, the nighttime humidity was real low. Next picture. You had high winds. They, for, almost half of the acreage in Yellowstone, the fire started in June, they went all the way to September. Four days, half of the acreage burned. Every one of those days, the wind was blowing 50 miles an hour. So it's that, this is the wind blowing fire across the landscape. Next picture. And wind, and this is a point I always hit on everybody, is exponential. It's not a linear effect. So if you have a, 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 a this is an example here of a 15 mile an hour wind showing how the fire spreads, and this is with a 20 mile an hour wind. Now imagine like in Southern California where you got the Santa Ana winds that are blowing 100 miles an hour. What kind of fire spread? This graph would go like that, you know? But, but seriously, anytime you get winds up in 30 or 40 or 50 miles an hour with a fire going, that's, you can't stop it. So you get this wind-driven pattern. This is in Yellowstone, here's Yellowstone Lake. And, and the reason you can't stop it is because you have this uh, spotting where the wind is blowing embers ahead. So let's say you built a fire line right here along the edge of this uh, fire front. Well, the wind just started a fire right here, you know? Or it started a fire over here, it started a fire here, here, here. So that's why it becomes impossible to confront one of these fires when the wind is blowing. Next picture. So this is a great quote. You can see these guys are getting the hell out of it. An early Forest Service ranger wrote an exam and answered the question, what would you do to control a crown fire? He wrote, get out of the way and pray like hell for rain. And, uh, and that's really good advice. And I, I remember I was doing, when I was writing an earlier book on fire in Yellowstone, I was going through some of the historical records and it was sort of a similar thing. This, uh, this ranger, it was in the 1930s, he said, well, and this is the final, you know, it's a type writer kind of report, typewritten. And at the end of it, he says, we finally got the fire out, had a hell of a time breaking camp in the rain. And he certainly didn't put the two together, you know? It's like, well, you know, yeah, you got the fire out because it rained. Okay. 
We're, we're going like that. Uh, which is more flammable, the snag or the green tree? The next picture. Actually, the dead trees don't have flashy fuels, which is the needles and so forth, the small branches. Next picture. But green trees under drought are like um, gasoline because they got resins in them. Look at how this thing is burning. And with the wind and so forth. And they have fine needles on them. That's what drives fires. That's why you have snags after a fire because the big trees, the bowls don't, don't burn, really. Next picture. So that's why you get all this dead wood. And fires are the major source of dead trees and downed wood in our ecosystem, in most of our ecosystem. Next picture. And they're biological capital that are reinvested in the next forest. Next picture. And biodiversity is second highest in severe burns. This is the opposite way you think. But actually, these ecosystems are rare because they don't last very long because the trees grow back. So this kind of, and the snags fall over and so forth. So this is, this is considered uh, rarer than old growth forests, because old growth forest conditions last for hundreds and hundreds of years. A condition like this maybe lasts at most 40 or 50 years. Next picture. So um, the snag habitat created by sand replacement fire is one of the rarest habitats in the West. I already made that point. Snag is critical to forest health compared to it, it provides shade, it, it reduces, uh, uh, slows the wind, and security for wildlife. But we have a deficit compared to the past. Next picture. And some of the statistics about it. 45% of all bird species use dead wood at some point in their life cycle. Next picture. And two thirds of all wildlife species depend on dead trees at some time. Next picture. <laughs> so even invertebrates. Ants are a major uh, home for ants. Ants are the most abundant invertebrate in the forest, and a lot of them live in dead logs. Next picture. And so they, uh, bears rely <coughs> on ants for 50% of their food in some months. Next picture. So, uh, it, you know, who would think that a forest fire 50 or 60 years ago creates bear habitat today? Uh, also, pollinators, bees, hornets, wasps, they live in dead trees on the ground and on snags, and they're important for all the pollination of the forest. Next picture. Or periodic use by some animals, like Martin in the Wyoming and stuff, where it's really cold, Martin are long, thin animal, weasel like. And if you don't have dead trees in their habitat, they don't exist because they are only there. Uh, they may only need it a week when it's 40 below, but if they don't have it, psh, there's no mark. So if you came in and salvaged logged the trees and got rid of all those dead trees, you just took out the mark habitat. Next picture. So now I'm finally getting to fish, but I'm about to run out. Percentage of native fish that are in peril. This shows you all across it. Native fish are in peril. Well, one of the factors, next picture, is that we are taking away a lot of their habitat. Next picture. And their ha uh, logging roads are different than fires. They're a chronic source. In other words, the logging road is there year after year after year putting sediment in the stream. Next picture. Whereas fires uh, recover relatively quickly. <coughs> Within a few years, usually, you get less uh, thing. But if you have a logging road, it'll cut across the uh, slope where the water would seep through, which creates more runoff, and, and it's a permanent impact. Next picture. And you have a ro fill erosion and stream crossings. Next picture. Uh, where the Sediment comes down the stream and gets into a uh, road and gets into the stream there. And that's, that's there all the time. Next picture. So what we find is logging roads are chronic toss of sediment with detrimental effects on fish. And here's some, this has to do with the amount of fine sediment that's getting in the stream. When you get up to 54%, both of these West Slope Cut Trout and Bull Trout disappear. Next picture. And then this is some uh, biological effects of roads. It was found that uh, <clears throat> when you get um, uh, too many miles of road, you just lose bull trout. So they're completely absent if you have more than 1.7 miles of road, I think. Next picture, per square mile. But regrowth on forest vegetation is very rapid. Here's one year after the 1988 Yellowstone fire. So there's, there was a lot of sediment flow, but within a few years you get this regrowth so that you don't get the sediment flow. Next picture. Uh, so here's comparison of erosion for tons per square mile a year. And you can see with low fire, moderate fire, high severity fire, you know, it's there, but compared to roads, it's nothing. And the real big thing is that the, the long-term average of sediment is really high with roads. Next picture. Okay. Uh, I go on. I'm going to. Okay. So here's Cache Creek. I'm going to end on this. This was the most severely burned drainage in Yellowstone in 1988. So this is what it looked like after 80 fires. Next picture. So, but it, all these dead trees were falling into the creek. Next picture. So the riparian vegetation is re recovered partly because the trees create bars on the river, next picture, and like this, so that it, the trees and willows can get established. The whole aquatic ecosystem, benefit, next picture, uh, they found that um, the fish recovery uh, within three to four years was back to pre-fire conditions. And the fish grow faster and because there's more abundant food on all the dead wood that 
creates for aquatic insects. Uh, this was a, a study in the Boise River found that fish of different ages were also different. For the youngest age classes, fish were small in the on bird drainage and largest in the burn drainages. So it actually increased size of fish. Uh, native fish, this is another important thing. We're always trying to preserve native fish. Non-native fish are not as adapted to fires as the native fish. And the native fish do better, like West Slope cutthroat and bull trout, in uh, the burnt, dealing with burns than, say, uh, brown trout or brook trout, which are exotic to this area. Okay. <laughs> Here, well, I'll, let, I'll finish on this order. Texas Severe Fire, North Fork of the John Day. Within four years after Severe Fire, distribution of juvenile steel, steelhead uh, and resident rainbow trout was similar to that before the fire. And that's a very common occurrence. Now, there are exceptions to everything I'm saying. Like, you can have a super storm that washes a lot of sediment in one particular drainage <coughs> and, you know, makes this not true. But across the board, most of the research supports this contention that. Um, after a fire, the fisheries recover relatively quickly. I mean, after all, we've had salmon and steelhead and trout in the Pacific Northwest for thousands of years, and they've done just fine with yeah. fires all the time. Right. And the only thing that's different now, we've got a lot more logging in the roads. Uh -huh. And they're not doing well. So that's the point. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, George. Again, I'm Doug Bevington. I'm with uh, the Environment Now Foundation. Yes? Could you stand up? You might be able to hear you better. Thanks, Doug. Can I just project? I'm a... Whoa, shoot. Okay. Just, uh... I'll try and project without standing, if that's okay. If you can't hear me in the back, let me know. The foundation I work with uh, specifically focuses on forest protection in California. And, um, and we've gotten involved with some grant making related to science issues because a number of our uh, partner groups that we work with on forest protection in California kept encountering this issue of the Forest Service saying, look, we need to log this area in order to protect it. This forest is in danger from all burning up in catastrophic fires and it's going to burn up the spotted owls. Don't use that word. That's their language. Okay. That's their language. I'll tell you what, what we were encountering. And, you know, and we're doing this to save the spotted owl and that sort of thing. And, you know, part of the challenge was that, or one of the things that came up for a lot of our partners was that these claims that we hear all the time, there's shockingly little research into the core assumptions that, that drive these logging projects. And, and there's also been what there has been, or what's gotten the most attention has been the Forest Service funded work. And again, they don't actually tend to look at the core questions. And when they do, they do it in, in problematic ways as I'm gonna discuss in greater detail. So we've been um, trying to support the work of scientists outside of the agency, people who are not either working for the Forest Service or funded by the Forest Service to look at some of these core questions. And, and that's also led us to a larger network of scientists who are also doing this outside of the Forest Service circles and finding really fascinating results. And I just want to highlight a few of the key studies that have come out just in this last year. There's a much larger uh, body of research that I'm also happy to point you to. But first, uh, first and foremost, one that just came out uh, in the past couple weeks. Um, this is in the journal PLOS One which is a high profile journal and it's also, it's an open access online journal. So this is something that you can, can uh, readily get to even if you don't have a, a university account. Here's the citation info up here. As you'll see, there are 11 co-authors on this. These represent scientists from throughout the Western US and Canada. And they correspond to the large scope of the study, which was looking at the history of fire patterns in what's sometimes called dry forests or ponderosa pine and mixed conifer forests throughout the western US and, and western Canada. And their core finding was that contrary to this common claim that, that, that George was referencing, that says you shouldn't have big, hot, high severity fires 
in Ponderosa Pine. There's a, that assumption that that's some sort of aberration. You didn't get that in the past. Those places were only uh, low severity fire, and if you're getting high severity fire now, that must be some sort of aberration, some sort of problem that needs to be fixed. And what these folks did is they went and looked at, at um, various forms of data, I'll get into that, and found consistently that there are consistent patterns of high severity fire as a component of these western forest ecosystems, these dry western forest ecosystems. And so that's their core finding is, when they talk about mix, I think it's a little different from, George was using it to sort of describe moderate effects. And what they're saying with mixed severity fire is that these fires, these ecosystems, have a mixture that includes high severity fire. It's not just low ground fires. And to get these results, they looked at multiple lines of evidence. They used various data sets as described here. And one of the things that they highlight was that it was the consistency of multiple lines of evidence for mixed severity fire in Ponderosa Pine and mixed conifer forests. That's an important finding. So they were finding evidence of it through these multiple forms of data source. Yeah, sources. One of the things that they did um, in this study that I think is important is that they focused on large scale <coughs> studies, things that had really looked at, at a large acreage. Uh, because folks who say, oh, there wasn't high severity fire in the past, tend to have done studies on, on fairly small areas. And when you look at a small area, it's much harder, you're much less likely to be able to detect historic high severity fire effects. And one of the things that this, this long quote here describes is that, yeah, there are these studies that get referenced and say, oh, well, we looked in this, basically, we looked through a soda straw, and this one little spot, we didn't find evidence of high severity fire in the past. Therefore, there must not have been high severity fire in these areas. But when you look at other studies that look at a larger scale, consistently find the evidence of high severity fire. Not only was there high severity fire in the past, they found that currently, there is less high severity fire in forest ecosystems now than there was historically. So there is a deficit of fire at all intensities, including high severity fire. So what is this, and, and they also talk about what this means for, for existing policy. Um, the idea is that it, the, many restoration projects, if they're premised on this notion that high severity fire was an aberration and we just want low severity fire or mainly low severity fire in the forest ecosystem, if you try to change the forest to create the, the condition, those conditions, it's not that you're restoring the forest, you're creating something entirely new and unprecedented and not the natural forest ecosystem there. And so that's, there's some fundamental problems with that. They also point out that there are actually positive implications to embracing this, this growing understanding that high severity fire is a natural part of most of these western forest ecosystems. They say, incorporating mixed severity fire into management goals and adapting human communities to fire by focusing on fire risk reduction activities adjacent to homes, that is, instead of trying to change things out in forest, may help maintain characteristic biodiversity, expand opportunities to manage fire for ecological benefits, reduce management costs, and protect human communities. So it actually leads to policies that are not only more ecologically sensible, but also more economically sensible, and can do a better job of helping communities to safely coexist with the natural forest, uh, natural fire regime. Another thing that just came out um, is a piece by Williams and Baker. And this relates to one of the forms of research that was incorporated into that PLOS One study that I, that I was just talking about. They use something called the General Land Office um, data set. So this is survey data of forests from the 19th century before fire suppression came into effect. It's a really great way to look at historic forest conditions on a large scale. And um, some of the, the scientists who were proponents of the old, what George called the Southwest model, the, you know, it's just low severity fire, put out a critique of this. Um, it was Thule and all. And now Williams and Baker have put a response that I think is very helpful. Um, it, it's certainly a very lively uh, exchange in terms of pointing out this consistent pattern of Thule and all ignoring large number of studies that don't support their thesis. 
and, and that, that problem of missing data. So as they point out, um, there are at least 23 other studies that they do not document, that do document extensive high severity fire that are missed in Thule at all. So that's something to keep an eye out for, is when studies are being overlooked or omitted. I also think that they offer an insightful point regarding the sort of um, the collaborative processes that we're seeing now. Talking about the legislation that led to the Collaborative uh, Forest Landscape Restoration Program, they write, this law presumes that uncharacteristically severe wildfire is common and requires reduction. Rather than requiring proposals to compile and review all available scientific evidence to guide restoration, if scientific evidence had been systematically reviewed, it would not have supported these programs. Another study, this is specific to Sierra Nevada, but um, I, I think it offers a lesson even if you're, if you're in other regions. For a long time, the Forest Service had relied on one, and then they sort of did a backup paper by the same Forest Service author saying, well, we've detected a recent trend of increasing fire severity. And so um, Hansen and Odeon went back and looked at, at how the Forest Service had studied this and found that the Forest Service had left out large amounts of acreage in their study. And they'd also, uh, there'd also been another methodological point that I won't get into. But when you correct for all those things, then the, that upward trend that the Forest Service described completely goes away. And so not only do they, when, when you use the full available data, you find there isn't an increasing trend and again, the rate of high severity fire has been lower in recent years than it was in historically, what it naturally should be. So why does all this matter, this, uh, this concern over whether there's more high severity fire now or less high severity fire now than there was in the past? High severity fire, as George highlighted, it's a productive force. It creates an important type of habitat and a technical term for it is complex early seral habitat. It's also called uh, snag forest habitat. But yeah, this post-fire uh, forest habitat, particularly post high severity fire, is, is some of the most ecologically rich, wildlife rich habitat out there. In California, De La Salle and all have a study highlighting the significance of this type of habitat for the Sierra Nevada. And that's something where they found that the Forest Service just didn't have a conceptual basis for thinking about post-fire forests as, as an important ecosystem component. They just treated it as those areas that have been destroyed by fire. And so that piece, uh, that was accepted in 2013. It's not actually pu uh, come out in print yet, but it's, it's due out in, in 2014, so look for that. And for folks outside of the Sierra Nevada, that built on uh, an earlier piece, Swanson et al., about um, highlighting the, the value of early seral forests. That's also a great resource. Now, within these snag forests, there's a lot of um, different wildlife that, that benefits. I'm going to focus on three different species. Blackback woodpecker. Blackback woodpecker is, is a species that directly depends on the, the um, post-fire forest habitat created by intense fires. That's where they feed. That's where they live. They are. That sort of association, we can kind of think of them as the spotted owl of post-fire forests. And there is a useful study that uh, came out this past year. Again, this is one that's available, open access online, ODN Enhanced in 2013, that looks at the sort of thinning and post-fire lo um, logging that, that's often being proposed in California and Oregon. It says, I think it was if you do 20% thinning and 33% uh, salvage logging, over a 27-year period, you are going to be reducing the available habitat for the woodpecker by 70%. So fire suppression, thinning, and post-fire logging are all hurting the blackback woodpecker. That's why there's currently a petition to get the woodpecker protected under the Endangered Species Act. And in 2013, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service made an initial positive 90-day finding that listing may be warranted. So that process is moving forward right now. The listing petition, you know, that's a scientific document that brings together the best available science on the blackback woodpecker. That petition is available on the Center for Biological Diversity website. So that's another great resource. So some people say, okay, well maybe blackback woodpeckers like fires, but but 
you know, other species must lose out, like the spotted owl. We associate the spotted owl with green tree forests, so preventing fire must be good for owls. Well, there's been a series of important studies by uh, Monica Bond and Derek Lee of the Wild Nature Institute. And they, um, Wild Nature Institute, I encourage you to check out their website. It's a great resource with videos and, and a variety of educational materials about the value of post-fire forests. They were the first ones to go out and say, okay, the Forest Service keeps saying, we're logging to save the spotted owl from fire. They're looking at the California spotted owl in the Sierra Nevada. And they did radio telemetry studies that, that looked and said, not only are spotted owls not uh, avoiding post-fire areas, but in fact, they preferentially forage in those areas. So yes, they like to nest in green tree forests. That's where they nest. But having adjacent high severity patches seems to be actually beneficial for um, for spotted owls. It, it's a, a relationship that's sometimes described as bedroom and kitchen. Green trees, bedroom, post fire forest, kitchen. Second study, they, they've actually done a number, I want to highlight three of them here. 2012 looked at this question of are fires reducing spotted owl populations? because there have been this anecdotal examples of, well, there was a fire and there had been an owl nesting there and now it's now not nesting there. But as they pointed out, spotted owls will move around on their own and do nests. So you have to take that natural shifting into account. And when they looked across the data for fires and, and spotted owls and what happened to them over time uh, in the Sierra Nevada, uh, what they found was large um, wildfires did not decrease spotted owl territorial occupancy. So there's not a choice, it's not a choice of fires or owls. And, and if anything, owls benefit from the fire in terms of habitat. Now their latest study that just came out in 2013, um, there have been another forest service, the forest service keeps saying, well, there must be some harm there. So maybe it's that they have to go look farther for food in a post-fire area, that they're just barely getting by. And the study showed, you know, there's no significant difference in the home range size, the area that they go to feed between post-fire areas and, and unburned forests. Final species I want to focus on, civic fisher. This is another one where in the, uh, civic fisher is a small mammal, uh, weasel in the, and there's a, a distinct population in the Southern Sierra. And down there, the Forest Service had, again, been gearing up to say, we know that they like um, old growth forests, therefore, fire must be bad for them, therefore, we must log to protect the, the fisher. They had never done a study looking at this question of, well, do fisher actually use post-fire forests? They had just gone from the assumption that if there's been intense fire there, fisher aren't going to use it. And they created models that said, we've got this problem. So, Hansen went out and did the first field study to actually look at this. Again, this is available open access online. Not only did he find that fishers are readily using post-fire forests, but what he found is there may be that same sort of kitchen uh, bedroom dynamic that, that we described as spot owl, but particularly with fishers, what they like is density. They like dense forest when it's green, and they like dense forest when it's burned, and those are the places you find them. And so these proposals to thin the forest in order to prevent fire, in order to protect the fisher, A, you don't need to prevent fire to protect the fisher. B, actually thinning the forest, the green tree forest, harms fisher habitat as well. So it's doubly counterproductive. There's a, a really good article that's just come out in the new High Country News about some fishers, and it talks about this research, and also the, the PLOS One article that I talked about at the beginning. One final point, which is that we often overlook the harms from these logging proposals that are portrayed as restoration. There's a tendency to just assume, oh, they say they're doing it for good reasons, so, you know, it must be a good, good project. And, and I think there's a real need for greater research to fully assess the effects of, the, of these projects done under the rubric of restoration. One great resource for, particularly for folks in the Pacific Northwest on this front, is Delisala et al. Uh, came out this uh, in 2013 in Journal of Forestry, and it's critiquing the ecological forestry that's being proposed by uh, 
Jerry Franklin and, and Norm Johnson, and that's being incorporated in their, the, the, the Franklin and Johnson proposals are being incorporated into Senator Wyden's ONC logging legislation and elsewhere. And there are a lot of problems with that. Uh, I'm short on time, so I'll just point out they have like a seven point critique of the ecological shortcomings of ecological forestry. One of them, just to highlight, is impacts on aquatics will likely increase. I think this is going to be a very important area in the, in the year ahead. Uh, Coast Range Association and Chris Frizzell are, are doing really uh, important cutting edge work on bringing that science together. So I encourage you to, to look, uh, look in that direction for useful resources moving forward. And uh, these are just sort of repeating core points, but I'll just go to the fourth point here and say that I think there's a real need to incorporate, to find the, the science and to incorporate it into uh, comments and appeals on specific projects. If you're participating in a collaborative process, make sure that that's part of the collaborative process. And as we're uh, going to see this new round of forest plan revisions, it's very important to get this science into the record there. Uh, one resource on that front uh, from the John Muir Project web's webpage is Forest and Wildland Science Synthesis for the Sierra Nevada. Again, while it focuses on the Sierra Nevada, many of its studies are applicable elsewhere. But Justin Augustine uh, of the Center for Biological Diversity is someone who's directly working on this, um, this role of getting the good um, science incorporated into the Sierra for the planning revisions. So I asked if he could just take a couple minutes to um, briefly talk about lessons or experiences no, from all that. Can I just yeah. interject one thing? Yeah. Um, I just want to emphasize Doug's point, which I was going to get to, but I ran out of time. But uh, <laughs> that a lot of these restoration or we're going to do things on fire have negative impacts that are overlooked or ignored or undervalued. Uh, the logging road I was emphasizing there, but you have introduction of weeds, you have fragmentation of forest habitat. A lot of those roads never go away. They put a gate up, but that doesn't keep people from using them. You have uh, a change in the uh, biomass out there. In other words, all this dead wood that's supposed to be good for animals uh, and, and fish. Uh, and there's soil erosion that happens. There's soil compaction with the logging equipment. So there's a whole lot of negatives that almost I know almost never read about, or if they're mentioned at all, they just sort of dismiss it as unimportant. So you've got to keep in mind, it's not just uh, uh, that restoration, uh, if, it, if you and I agreed it was necessary, you have to weigh it against all the negatives that come with that work, including the fact that they almost always lose a lot of money on it, too. Uh, and is this the best way to restore our fire, forest? So, thank you. Next, uh, <laughs> Again, I'm Justin Augustine, Center for Biological Diversity. I work out of our San Francisco <coughs> office, and I'm attorney there. And basically, my job is to comment on and litigate thinning projects, post-fire salvage projects, and deal with the forest plan revisions that are just about to be set in motion for the Southern Sierra early adopters, the Inyo, Sequoia, and Sierra National Forest. And it's been nice to see that even though the Forest Service you know, they don't change much, but they do change in slight increments. And even in the last year, going off of some of the stuff that uh, both Doug and, uh, and George were talking about, we've seen we're at the beginning of the, um, what I will call the pre-scoping process for the forest plan revision, where they were doing these things called um, biological assessments. Um, those at the beginning were saying, we have too much high severity fire on the landscape in the Sierras, blah, blah, blah. But now we're seeing at least a sentence or two here and there acknowledging that we're actually in a fire deficit, not just generically speaking as to low, moderate, and high, but as to all fire severities. And that's coming from the Forest Service itself. So these things do have an impact, even if it's extremely small and incremental. Um, they can't ignore the science is really what it boils down to. And kind of like with Odeon et al., that new paper as to using multiple data sources, what I've been doing over the last three years is coming at high severity fire and that type, those type of issues from what I would broadly call the wildlife data point. And we've had just a lot of science come out as to black, not just black but woodpeckers, but they're kind of the, cen the centerpiece of all this, showing that when you try to argue that high severity fire is somehow, somehow out of place, well, it actually turns out that the very places, the densest pre-fire areas 
Those are the very places post-fire that blackback woodpeckers are drawn to. The most recent research out of the Sierras, uh, you can find it on the Institute for Bird Population website, Siegel et al. 2013. The smaller the home range, the higher the snag density. And that really says a lot about um, the Forest Service's approach to sit, where they're saying just the opposite, that we have to thin these dense places because they're abnormal, they're an abstraction, when in fact, when you look at the data, the same world from a, the eyes of a blackback woodpecker, they're saying, I like that dense forest. And it turns out also, you know, we hear what Doug was getting at, the California spotted owl, you hear often from the Forest Service and even sometimes within the environmental community that, well, we have to protect the spotted owl from fire. Well, it's not static, it's dynamic. And these very places where pre-fire you see the spotted owls using at, at, the, at a preferential basis, those are the exact same places where you get the blackback woodpeckers thriving, thronging to whatever the right word is, um, post-fire. So yes, you're going to have some ebb and flow as to whether a particular spot on the landscape is great from an owl's perspective as to say nesting or roosting, but um, it's, we're going to have fire and it's going to benefit some species and it's going to actually benefit owls to some degree as well, but <coughs> a particular spot they may no longer use that for nesting, they may use that spot for foraging. So it's important to keep in mind that um, while certain spots <coughs> in the landscape will in fact change as to certain species, um, they also become the best places for other species and you're still going to be able to use those from say a fisher's perspective and an owl's perspective, but for different reasons, such as foraging, foraging as opposed to nesting. <laughs> so fortunately, we have people like Chad Hansen. It really is a handful of people these days who are independent and do ans asking the questions that uh, aren't being asked. Because um, my experience has been that for 30 years, we've had a ton of research about fishers in the Sierras. And yet no one ever bothered to ask that simple question, are fishers using post-fire landscapes? And Chad did a nice job also because of the way the Forest Service treats him. He, used, he was smart and used um, scat dogs so that he couldn't be questioned as to um, the methodology. So you really have some really good data coming out of these handful of folks like Monica and, and Chad and, and others that really is going to the basis, the very basics of post-fire landscapes as opposed to first assuming that post-fire landscapes are bad and then figuring out whether thinning is good or bad for those species. I mean, if you get, if you ask the first question, then you never actually need to get to that second question of why or does thinning, do thinning projects cause harm to, uh, to these wildlife species that we're theoretically trying to protect from fire. But that said, there has been uh, some science that Doug didn't mention that I'll briefly mention that came out in the last year as to even thinning projects. Um, a master's thesis, Garner 2013, found that at the home range scale, there were thinned areas within a forest, or excuse me, within a fisher's home range. But then when it scaled down, he found that those are the very areas that those fishers were avoiding on the landscape. So even though within the home range, someone could say, oh look, these thinned areas are part of their home range. Well, yes, they are, but they're actually being avoided. Um, most recently with the blackback woodpecker, there's a lot of pushback from the Forest Service. Um, at least now they acknowledge the importance of it, uh, post-fire habitat for the species, but they like to also try to pretend that unburned forest will somehow save this species that preferentially selects burned forest. And out of the Black Hills, um, uh, Rhoda et al. 2014, as well as his PhD, Rhoda 2013, both of those get at this issue and found that at least with their data set, they're seeing only uh, positive population growth in burned forest one or two years post fire, and they were seeing negative population growth in unburned forest, including unburned forest um, that had high beetle kill. So that really goes to show that um, these post fire landscapes are not just part of the mix, they are the mix when it comes to species like blackback woodpecker. And the research that's coming out of the Sierras. Um, including from within the Forest Service itself these days, which is uh, nice to see that they're letting some of their biologists do some decent work. Um, they're finding that not just the blackback woodpecker is using these landscapes, but that the blackback woodpecker and other woodpeckers are creating um, habitat in those initial, five pre or initial years post-fire 
And then several years post-fire, the cavities that the woodpecker created are being used by mountain bluebirds, martens, and a ton of other avian species. And then the shrubs that come in are being used by a lot of avian species. So you really do have a issue of time since fire that people need to keep in mind because it's not just a static moment post-fire either. You have an entire progression of wildlife that uh, recent research, both as to woodpeckers and other birds, is showing it to be critical, a critical element of biodiversity, not just in the Sierras, but in places like the Black Hills and Cascades as well. So I'll try to wrap up by saying, you know, we're, right now we're, like, we're preparing to litigate the um, rim fire because there's been proposed uh, over 75%, or excuse me, over 50% of that habitat, high quality blackback woodpecker habitat, has been proposed to be salvage log. Same thing as to two other fires that happened in the Sierras this summer, the Aspen and American. So we're gearing up for all of that, and all of the science has been critical to addressing that. And I'll end by noting that we've been fortunate in that um, because of the multitude of science coming their way, the Forest Service is now, at least as to the rim fire, um, having workshops just about the wood blackback woodpecker, and they're paying attention to this issue much more seriously as to whether they'll actually do something right as, a pro as an outcome is yet to be seen. But this is the first time in my experience where they're actually inviting um, biologists to come and speak and provide recommendations about how to protect post-fire landscapes. Thank you.